A warm welcome to this journey, this extraordinary journey of integrating Christian contemplative experience with the, the gay journey, the gay sexual experience. And I'm aware that as I begin to talk, although we're separated by time and space, we truly are not separate because in spirit there's no separation, there's no time and space, there's no division. As Thomas Merton said in the last talk he gave before he died, brothers, we are already one. We only imagine that we are not. So let's take a moment to be silent and to be still so that we may really be in our hearts that what I speak may be from my heart and perhaps in some sense from the heart of God and that it may also speak to your heart where you are in your place, in your time, in your life's journey. So let's be silent together. And I'm aware in the silence of all our ancestors, of all those gay men and women down through the centuries of Christian history who've lived and loved other gay men, other gay women, and who've lived and loved their journeys in company with Christ, many of whom have suffered and died for those loves. And we pray that their spirit may be with us and may guide us and enlighten and enliven us. In scripture it says that no word of God goes forth and returns to God empty without accomplishing what that word was sent for. And so my prayer is also that these, these simple poor words that, that I offer you may in some sense carry something of that word of the divine and that it may go forth into your heart and your life and achieve and accomplish what it was sent for, which may not be my plan and may not be your plan, but which is the plan of the divine lover to draw us deeper into the divine embrace in every step we take in our lives. This journey of the gay contemplative life is an extraordinary one and one that in many ways has never been fully explored or fully talked about. When I use the word firstly gay, what I'm talking about primarily in th these tapes is to gay men. Um, I'm a gay man, I'm not a gay woman, I'm not a lesbian woman, I can't speak for women, nor can I speak for heterosexual men. Hopefully some heterosexual men and women and some lesbian women will listen in and draw from these tapes what is good for them and you are most welcome. But primarily what I say will come from the life experience of a gay man and be directed to the life experiences of other gay men. Men who, who primarily, not solely, but primarily find their affectionate fullness, their life companionship and their major sexual delight in loving other men. When I speak of Christian, I'm not speaking of, of people who are fully paid up card-carrying members of the Catholic club or of any other Christian denominational club. I'm not speaking necessarily of people who, who buy or accept or subscribe to all of the doctrines um, and all of the teachings and all of the history of Christianity. The people I am speaking to, what I am speaking of, are those who find in the story of Christ in the words of scripture, in Christian heritage, a model, a pattern, a guide, a myth, a great story, which can inform our lives and our hearts, our living and our loving. I'm also, I suppose, speaking to people who have a particular commitment and devotion to Jesus, to the Christ, in the many different ways we image him, including those who image Christ as Christa, or Sophia, the divine wisdom, so that the feminine principle is also included in our love for Christ. In no sense is it excluded. And when I speak of contemplative, a more difficult word, what I'm speaking about is a certain way of being spiritual, a certain way of living Christian life, which has its roots in silence, in the experience of the desert, in experience of emptiness, of dryness, of, of quiet, of peace within, I'm certainly not speaking primarily from 
the activist mode. You know, most of Christianity in recent centuries has been extremely active, and a lot of our spiritualities have centered around um, simply actively loving other people, which of course is always at the heart of the Christian journey. But sometimes it's spoken about as if that's it. And the contemplative journey is really about the inner life, the life hidden with God in Christ, as we say, often hidden from oneself in many senses, a life of trust, um, a life of openness, a life of stillness. It's the life which, in terms of its historical incarnation, often in the desert or in monasteries, not a lot of people are called to. But it's also the life which really is the wellspring and the heart of Christian spirituality. Time and time again through Christian centuries you find that it's the contemplatives that people turn to to develop their sense of what it means to be spiritual, what it means to be Christian. And this, this tradition, which is really at the heart of Christianity, in many ways has been lost in the very activist, very um, outgoing, external oriented West in recent times. It's still very much present in the Eastern Orthodox churches and certainly in pockets in the West. But we tend to have lost a lot of this wisdom so that people turn to the Eastern religions thinking that there is no contemplative tradition, no mystical tradition within Christianity. And here I'm not talking about um, so-called esoteric Christianity, which draws from Gnostic te texts, some genuine and some spurious. I am talking about the mainstream, deep Christian tradition of mysticism, which is present in all the writings and is available for everyone. I would hope that this, this journey we take together in these tapes may, if nothing else, be partly a recovery of some of that profound tradition. I note that uh, Thomas Merton, again, when he visited the Dalai Lama and many of the high lamas around him in Dhammasala, came away saying that in his conversations, and by the way, Thomas Merton was a great admirer of, particularly of Buddhism, a tremendous admirer of Buddhism, that the lamas and he ended up agreeing that everything they had was also in Christianity. But then Thomas Merton was a, a contemplative par excellence. He knew the tradition deeply. And it's only when we go deeply into the tradition that we find this profound contemplative wisdom. That's what we hope to do in these tapes. So, having said all those disclaimers and, and setting out that geography, let's begin. There's a wonderful poem at the beginning of a book by M.C. Richards, a book called Centering. It's by a man called John Middleton Murray, and I think it should be printed on a holy card and given to every Christian at baptism. And it goes like this. For the good man, the good person, to realize that it is better to be whole than to be good, is to enter on a straight and narrow path, compared to which his previous rectitude was flowery license. to be whole rather than good. And I note that those words, straight and narrow path, come from scripture, where Jesus says that the road to life is straight and narrow and few enter on it. And I think implicit in the poem is the idea that the road to wholeness rather than goodness, as it's commonly understood, even within a lot of Christian teaching and certainly within the society as a whole, witness you know, the moral majority, for example, that to be whole is a journey, a road that few people really enter on. It asks everything of us and it will challenge everything within us and transform us totally. No wonder that few people enter on it. But it is the road of the contemplative journey. As we begin this journey, I'm also conscious too that there will be some people who are asking why bother with Christianity. Christianity has been so much associated, especially with the oppression of gay people, in, in including today. This is not something that has necessarily dramatically changed, especially in the US, that for a lot of gay people it's painful to even hear the word Christian and certainly to consider the idea that one could uh, find in Christianity a path to wholeness of life as a gay person. I'd like to tell you a story 
A few years ago, when I was living in the US, it was Christmas time and it was winter here. I come from Australia, as you may have gathered. In Australia, of course, it was high summer and it was Christmas Eve and it was cold and I was feeling very alone, very lonely, very despondent, thinking about my family, at the same time thinking about a lot of family stuff as we tend to do at Christmas time, a lot of family pain and dysfunction that we all share. Christmas has passed, um, coming to mind. I was also aware of pain within the Christian tradition of the beauty of Christmas and the message of God becoming human, that the vulnerability of the little child, the intimacy of Mary and Joseph in the stable, but all the trips that Christianity has laid on us down through the centuries. And while I was reflecting on this, I got a phone call from 8,000 miles away across the Pacific. And it was my younger sister, who I'm very close to. And while we were chatting, she said, I'd like to play you something. And she played for me over the phone a piece of music, which I would love to play for you, but legalities um, preclude that, unfortunately. It was something I had never heard. It was the Irish singer Enya. And what she was singing was not something from Watermark or something familiar. It was Silent Night, and she was singing it in Gaelic. Now, Gaelic is the ancient Irish language, which was largely stamped out during the uh, penal days, during the days of persecution, in an attempt to squash the Irish and to squash the Catholic religion in Ireland. It's also a language which goes back to pre-Christian times, so it, it dates before the advent of Christianity with its own persecution of the Celtic religion. Somehow when I heard that music in Gaelic, it was, by the way, my ancestors are, are Celtic, are Irish, and our family has a fairly strong Irish flavor to it, especially in my mother. It was as if I was hearing my family language from before all the pain, from before the dysfunction, from before the particularities of the mess that I inherited within my own family. And somehow this language, which I didn't fully understand, reached through the centuries, through my, from my ancestors, to me in that moment, my true family, my true heritage, and touched me. At the same time, I was hearing Silent Night, and it felt the same with Christianity, as if the pure and simple story of God becoming human to love us more deeply, and to draw us into God's love, as if that simple story reached across all the centuries of pain and persecution, of the burning of gay people, of the death of so many women, and that that pure, pure story touched me as well in that moment, brought to me by the love of my sister, by a real physical human being who I love and who loves me. And this pure note, sounding literally across 8,000 miles of the dark Pacific, was like a pure note of my true tradition sounding through the centuries to touch my heart. And my prayer is that in all that we say in these tapes, the pure note of Christian tradition, the pure note of truth, the pure note of deep spiritual life, which is for all, and especially for those most oppressed, most rejected, that that pure note will sound in your heart. You'll hear the language of your true family, You'll hear the true language of spiritual life. So in this session, this first session, what I want to do is to lay down some fundamental principles of the spiritual life and of integrating the gay experience with the spiritual life in the Christian tradition. I also want to offer some notes for spiritual directors. In the Christian tradition, we have an ancient um, heritage of looking for spiritual guides or mentors who are not gurus as in the Hindu tradition but as someone who has walked the, the journey before us, perhaps more deeply than us, and could be a mentor, can listen to us and our story, and listen for that pure note within our story, and reveal it to ourselves, help us to attune our ears and our hearts to hear it. So this is also for spiritual directors as well. This journey that we're going to take is fundamentally a journey from slavery to freedom to the glorious freedom of the children of God, which is the heritage of every human being. A journey from oppression and persecution 
to liberation, from death to new life. And of course, the great model of all Christian life is the death, of death, death and resurrection of Jesus. From fragmentation to full union within, from brokenness to wholeness, from being asleep to being fully awake, from being half alive to being alive. It's truly a liberation theology, a liberation spirituality, as all true spiritualities must be. If they bind, if they enslave, they are no true spirituality, whatever tradition they come from. This term, a liberation theology or liberation spirituality, as many of us are aware, arose in Latin America in the last few decades from people who had been oppressed for centuries, oppressed economically, oppressed um, in terms of their land, oppressed in terms of their self-image, and who had also experienced religion as something which, although it spoke to them in their own lives, was also used as a tool of their oppression. And so some of the wisdom that we will look at comes from them, from those poor people, many of whom have died for the sake of this tradition, of this liberation, and continue to die. Many, I might add, many of their deaths funded and supported covertly through this culture that we share in the West. I'm thinking of something Paul Manette said in his book, uh, Becoming a Man. A wonderful line where he simply said, such obedient slaves we make with such very tidy rooms. The first step in liberation is to realize that we are in slavery, to see, to see the truth of our situation, however painful it may be to face the fact that we are in slavery. This can be the hardest for those who benefit most from the slavery. And so particularly, it can be difficult for white Western men. Because if we keep our slavery hidden, if we, we obey the laws, we, if we are obedient slaves with tidy rooms, we can enjoy all the privileges of being white men in our culture. Now, to wake up and see that as slavery is a great act of courage. It's also a great shock, and it's a great challenge. And we are the ones who can find it most difficult. As usual, it's the poor who are most inclined to take this journey um, because the poor don't have much to lose. They don't have much to lose. So blessed are the poor again and again, as Jesus said because they have the courage to journey. It's our recognition that we are the poor and oppressed that allows us to go on this journey with them. This is to enter the way of conscientization, which is the term used in Latin America, which also carries the sense of conscience, of learning what we have to do in our deepest heart, what our true core is. It's also something that was very real for the monks, the desert monks in the first centuries of Christianity, we'll talk about them a little later, who formed the basis of a lot of Christian spirituality and especially the contemplative tradition. But they woke up and realized they were in slavery in the societies in which they lived and they left them. So this, this seeing, this coming or becoming aware is fundamental in the Christian spiritual tradition and in gay life. The second step is to believe that things could be different. To analyze the causes of our oppression and our slavery, to analyze them ruthlessly and honestly, and then to imagine the possibility of life being different for us. In doing this and in all that we do, we need to form communities. This is very hard to do and very hard to sustain, very hard to hold alone. We need to form communities of resistance and communities of support, true communities that will discern together. The next stage is to turn to scripture and to turn to the tradition, the tradition of spirituality, the tradition of Christian life that we share, and to find that it is our story. It is the story of the oppressed and the enslaved. It is not the story of the powerful. It's the story of the powerless. It's our story. As I say, this is also true of the spiritual literature which fills 2,000 years of Christian living. It's our story. 
And to, to really own this, we need a very good what's called exegesis. We need to break down the texts to discover what belongs to simply their cultural conditioning and what is in fact the pure note that can speak to us in our time and in our situation. So learning and true wisdom is very important in doing this. I'd like to compare this with the tradition of the monks. Lexio Divina is, is the bread and butter of, of the life of monks. And it's, it's about reading scripture not as an academic, but not without academic wisdom either. But you read it prayerfully and reflectively and slowly. And when something touches your heart, you stop and you stay with that. You go no further. And you sit in that and you allow that to fill your whole being and to draw you into silent presence. And when it's time to move on, you take up the scripture again. This is the way we need to read scripture. This is the way we need to find our story in it. To do this, of course, as a gay man and a lesbian is to be very daring. We have been told that our stories are not in the scripture and that if they are, they're only there in order to condemn us. So to take it up and to really fully see it as speaking to us in our sexuality, not just in our so-called spiritual life, but in our sexual lives as well, is still quite daring for most Christians, for most people on any spiritual path, because sexuality and spirituality supposedly do not interweave. They oppose one another. In fact, the reverse is true. The next stage, of course, is to act. The question, what then must we do? We've seen our slavery, we've formed communities of resistance and support. We've come to believe things could be different. We've analyzed our oppression. We've read the story and taken it into our hearts and seen it as speaking to us. We've dared to believe it could be our story. What do we, know, what do, we do next? What is the call? What then, how must we move? Okay, what, what does this lead us to? Both in an overall direction for our lives and in very specific situations. In Latin America, this, this process is, is directed to very specific situations like a, a strike or a, a statement by the government or another example of oppression. And I think a little of ACT UP, you know, um, often looking at specific instances and saying, what do we do now? What do we do about this? So there's, there's also a need to move, not just to reflect. Now, in all of this, part of the subtext is education. Education. We can't do this just by sitting in a room and becoming spiritual. We also have to educate ourselves. And this is especially true for people who are involved in spiritual direction. That many gay men and lesbians will come to you um, really believing that the story of Christianity is one of oppression and slavery and that they don't find their stories in scripture and tradition. Now, if you're going to be a guide for them, or if you're not a spiritual director, if we're going to support one another, we have to be educated ourselves, both in true scriptural understandings and in the life story of gay men and lesbians, so that we can become resources for one another and no longer slaveries, no longer slaves to the version of our stories that has been handed to us. So education is really important. It's especially important because the church itself, the very what is supposed to be the very way to wholeness and holiness for people in Christianity is very often the one who does the worst oppressing. And to become free of that, very often we need someone else to speak those words of freedom to us. And that person has to have done their homework. So if you're working with gay and lesbian people, educate yourself around conscientization, around what it means to be gay and lesbian and our experiences and around what it can be to apply scripture to that journey of liberation. In doing this, whether we're guiding someone else or supporting each other, we have to be aware this is a very, very painful journey. It will shake us up in every moment of our lives. It will shake up all that we've ever believed about Christianity and about Christ and especially about the church. It will shake up what we believe about ourselves. So there is a real need for gentleness, for patience, for a quiet leading with love and understanding and acceptance, for a word that liberates from guilt, 
Okay, because as we start to break the molds we've been handed, um, start to violate the so-called laws we've been given, we feel the pain of this, we feel the danger of this, we feel out on a limb, we feel fragile, we feel as if, is this, is this, it? Is this it? Am I getting it? Am I, I way off? And we need words which can help us and reassure us that this is the way. Trust the spirit within. Trust your own wisdom. And this also can involve a certain kind of leaving of the church, which is very painful for someone who takes their life with Christ seriously. Now this leaving and all the coming out talk that I will use in these tapes, I don't essentially necessarily mean coming out in the full public sense. Although, you know, to be honest, that is where my own tendencies lie. And I noticed recently a Zen master in San Francisco was saying, you can't practice Zen unless you are fully out, because you can't be true in the moment. And there's a certain sense to that. But of course, more important than coming out publicly is coming out within, coming out to God, if you like, coming out in our own spiritual lives. That's the true coming out, which either must proceed or must follow or must accompany any other kind of coming out. And that's the more painful one, I believe. That is the more painful one, because it's us that is being shattered and remade. Our conditionings, our senses of self, not so much the world around us. Many of us have given our lives to the church, have given our lives to Christ in the church, and to have our understandings of, of Christ and of the church broken and shattered is extremely painful. So we need to go slowly and gently and allow this to happen in its own time and by the grace of the Spirit. It's not for us to take up the hammer and shatter the container. The container will break, but it will break because the fullness within is breaking it, like, like a bird breaking an eggshell from within. The mother doesn't come up with the beak and break the shell. She allows the bird within, the Holy Spirit within, to break the container when the time is right. This is always God's initiative. This is not our doing. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. If it weren't, I would be very reluctant to invite anyone on this way because this way is so demanding and it will shatter all that we are, all that we know of ourselves. It has to be the work of the Holy Spirit which leads us forward. At the same time, sometime there may be the need to speak a challenging word. Not in anger or frustration, but in truth. Sometimes the right word can be the gong sounding, can be the Zen master using the stick to wake up the pupil. But always this has to be discerned from within and reluctantly. We don't speak the challenging word, the deeply challenging word, too readily, too quickly. This, of course, is very clear when full coming out is involved. Full coming out, in a public sense, um, can mean people's careers, um, people's families, even, of course, people's lives. And I really believe this has to be a movement of God within us. Uh, we can help one another and support one another and prepare the ground, but the final movement has to be God's. The costs are too great. They're too painful. It has to be a decision from the person within. And in some senses, I truly believe that God leaves us free in that moment, that the Spirit may lead us to that point, but there's a freedom that we can make this choice or not. And I do believe that sooner or later we will make it if we are following the lead of the Spirit. But always there's this respect for the integrity and the dignity and the freedom of the individual. And that must come from us as well as from God. In all of this, what we have to be doing is listening. And this really, this whole talk is about the truth of our experience. Carter Haywood said, the only theology that is worth anything at all is theology born in the crucible of experience. The truth. And if there's one thing that, honest to God, that I could say to gay and lesbian people in the church, it is tell the truth, first to ourselves and then to others. The truth of our experience. I am tired of hearing other people tell us what we experience or how we should experience it. Theology and spirituality have traditionally been referred to as 
faith-seeking understanding. Great, great term, but we tend to think of faith as something in the head, you know, like a notion or assent to doctrines and truths and formulations. That is not what faith is. Faith is the response of the whole person, body, mind, spirit and heart. That's what faith is. It's our whole life in every moment, in all our relating, including our sexual relating. Now that kind of faith, seeking understanding, that's true theology. That is true spirituality. Some of the people who are so-called doing the theology and doing spirituality need to step back a couple of steps and live and, and let faith happen first, true faith in the body, in the life. Then they can do theology. I wonder if this is not the problem why a lot of our theology seems so dead and so utterly irrelevant. And I speak as someone who studied theology for a number of years, so I, I have some sense of what I'm talking about. And after a while, you think, why bother? I mean, who really cares? Who is this speaking to? Um, it has to come from lived experience and be a reflection on lived experience. And I think as gay and lesbian people, we can really offer some of these gifts to the church because anything that's going to do us any good in theology or spirituality will have to speak to our bodies and to the truth of our lives. Now here I come to a very crucial point in, in the whole series of tapes that we're going to, to go through together. And this is that our spiritual and our historical lives, our actual lives in history, are not separate. We do not have a so-called inner life and a so-called outer life. Even though, you know, for the sake of talking, we have to sometimes use those terms and make distinctions. We live one life. We are one organism, one whole, one reality. And we, we can't buy into this, this splitting, this dualism, which says, well, this is, this is the way I am internally. But, you know, when I go to work, I can be completely different. Or when I go to church, I can be completely different. Now, a lot of gay people have done this or have had to do this to survive. Well, folks, the time has passed. Let's take some risks. Let's, let's lead the way a little. Let's be on the edge. We so often have been in history. Why not now when it's so deeply needed by so many people? Our historical and spiritual lives are one. Our bodily lives, our spiritual lives are one. Um, someone said, I can't remember, that in our lovemaking is the way we discover how we love God. Uh, these are not separate split-off bits of us. It's one. Now, a lot of spirituality, and this is a serious problem for someone who wants to mine the spiritual literature, is written as if the historical lives did not occur. It's a really serious problem. In fact, if you read the biographies of the people who wrote the stuff, a lot of the same things were happening in their historical lives as well. A classic example for me is that John of the Cross, one of the great spiritual masters in the Christian tradition, in one of his most wonderful poems, speaks about escaping on a dark night by a secret ladder where none saw him and he goes out into the streets to pursue the beloved. Now this poem in the dark night of the soul was written sometime after John had in fact escaped from a prison where he had been persecuted and beaten and tortured by his own brothers in the Carmelite monastic order in the uh, 17th century Spain and he'd had a new jailer after several months of really painful treatment, really inhuman treatment. And this guy was a little bit more human, and he allowed John to have a needle and thread to, to sew his clothes. And John used the needle and thread to sew things together and made a ladder and escaped down out of the, out of the jail on a dark night, seen by no one. Now later, this, this appears in John's poetry, and in his then very developed analysis of that poem in relation to spiritual life. But it actually happened in history. It was in his actual life. Teresa of Avila, another one of our great mystics, has a crucial life-turning moment when she reads the Confessions of St. Augustine and recognizes herself there. And when she sees an image of Christ crowned with thorns and suddenly her heart is split open and her whole life changes and she begins to become the Teresa we know of. Now, when did this happen? When she turned 40. Midlife, folks, midlife. She'd lived one kind of life and there was a seminal turning point and her life fell apart and the second journey began. The true Teresa that we now know as Teresa of Avila, Saint Teresa of Avila. It's an historical fact. It happened in her historical life, not just in her spirit. 
we look at Therese of Lisieux, a, a wonderful um, French Carmelite woman of the last, late last century who died of uh, tuberculosis at the age of 24. And Therese talks about the death of love. All her writings are about the death of love and being consumed by the love of God. And she really believes that that's how her life is, is, is being lived out and how it's coming to an end. Now, it's interesting that the old term, although I'm sure, not sure what it was in French, but the old term for tuberculosis was consumption. And no doubt you know, there was some sense of that in the European consciousness of being consumed by this condition. Now when Therese talks of being consumed by the love of God and dying the death of love, she is literally in those months being consumed by tuberculosis. This is also happening in her historical life, which is not, not that I'm saying that it was God who consumed her by tuberculosis or that it was God who imprisoned John of the Cross, but that these people's reflection on their experience is not just an internal reality. It's a reflection on their lived bodily experience. Their historical and spiritual lives are one reality. The most classic example of this, of course, is the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, when Jesus uh, had his moment of truth in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, asking that the cup be taken away from him, but then surrendering to the will of God, was this some charade he put on for the sake of the Gospel writers? Or was this a true experience? Well, in his historical life, he had to face the fact that what he was being called to was to walk into a total death to self, a very agonizing, painful death. And the spiritual reality of that surrender was also an actual physical, historical surrender. Our spiritual and our historical lives are one. Now, in following that truth and listening to our experience, what we're going to encounter is the God of surprises. God is going to turn up the divine grace, the spirit, whatever word you want to use, is going to turn up in all kinds of moments and places and times and context where we least expect, given our conditioning, to encounter the divine. A couple of examples of this. Jesus is the classic one. He couldn't be boxed in. Jesus says, in some sense, the love of God made flesh. You know, he could be with the poorest of the poor, the most rejected, the most outcast, be with the prostitutes, be intimate with the prostitutes. He could also turn around and go to dinner with the Pharisees. You know, they also said of him, this man is a drunken and a, a, a drunkard, sorry, and a glutton. Um, he was also criticized because he, he ate with, you know, the higher classes as well as the lower classes. You can't box this guy in. He moves around and where the grace of God in some sense is needed or there is any level of openness, he will be there. And this is true in our lives too. The Spirit will be there in any moment where there is openness, whether we are conscious of it or not, conscious of the Spirit or conscious of our openness. Sometimes we can be becoming open without realizing it and boom, up will come a rush of grace, a rush of the presence of God into our consciousness. And we hadn't thought we were being spiritual at all. I often have been asked in my, uh, my ministry, my work, to invoke the Holy Spirit, to call down the Holy Spirit at the beginning of meals or weddings or academic years. And, you know, I think this is a dangerous thing. Um, I, I don't think this is necessarily a good idea. Um, People tend to do it as if this is a political thing. Well, of course, you know, you, you, you'll invoke the Holy Spirit. Well, hang on. Um, if I invoke the Spirit on your academic year or on your wedding or on your birthday, you better be ready for the fact that things can happen that you're not necessarily wanting to have happen. If you give over your marriage or your life or your academic year to the Holy Spirit, you better be ready for your agenda to go out the window. This is not something we do lightly. The Holy Spirit does her own work in her own way. And we're either open or we're not. If we're not, don't invoke her. It's, it's a sham, it's a charade. And who knows, she might just turn up. And why wouldn't we be surprised? Now, this also is very important, this idea of the God of surprises. Um, when people work with gay and lesbian people, critical, or when we try and support one another in the spiritual journey. Because I absolutely believe that sexual experiences will open us in, in most radical ways to the grace of God. I like to speak of the term the promiscuity of grace. 
that wherever there is a chance, grace will come in. Even the slightest crack, grace will come in. And hey, there are lots of cracks, there are lots of openings in sexual experience. Could you, as a director, for example, here I speak directly to people who may be doing spiritual direction, how would you handle it if someone came to you having just had their first experience with S&M, for example, with sadomasochism, and they had had, a, had what they experienced as a deeply spiritual awakening. Could you handle that? Would that just be too, too, too beyond the pale? Would that shatter too many of your categories? Are you prepared to believe that whatever the goods, bads, rights or wrongs, wisdom or lack of it around what they did, can you believe that the spirit can still come through break through and be present in those moments? Or are you the one with the problem? If you're the one with the problem, either, you know, if the, if the kitchen's too hot, get out. If you can't handle this kind of promiscuity of grace, which comes from the heart of God, pursuing us in every moment, in every situation, especially in sex, then you ought not be working with gay and lesbian people. Go home, do your homework, do your own work first. Have your own awakenings, your own revelations. Have your own containers shattered, then come back, and perhaps then you might be privileged enough to be ready to work with gay and lesbian people. Now, all that's happening here and happening in these containers of morality, especially being shattered, or at least at the very least being deeply challenged, is that what gay people are learning is the law of the heart. Now, there's a wonderful saying in Jeremiah, which I'll quote. Jeremiah was one of the prophets writing in Israel after the exile in Babylon. And Jeremiah talks of the days when the new covenant, the fullness, will come. And he quotes God, Yahweh, saying, Deep within them I will plant my law, writing it on their hearts. There will be no further need for neighbor to try to teach neighbor, brother or sister to try and teach brother or sister. No, they will all know me, the least no less than the greatest. One of the most beautiful quotes in scripture, but we don't believe it. We spend our time setting up rules, regulations, telling one another how we ought to be experiencing the divine. Not trusting that now that the new covenant has come and is inviting us all into a feast of freedom and of life, that if we go deep enough, we will find this law written on our hearts. And it is the law of freedom and love not the law of constraint, of rigidity, of regulations. This is not to say we can't offer each other the fruit of our wisdom, but that's very different from trying to give each other boxes and ironclad rules. That is, I think, the key problem with the moral teaching of the church at the moment. Not that it oughtn't be offered, but it's offered as, as um, railway lines. And if you don't stay to these, by God, you're going to have a crash, or at the very least, you're going to be pushed out of the train, rather than as simple lessons in wisdom that has been passed down through the centuries, which we can dialogue with according to the law written in our own hearts. That's the only way true morality is ever passed on to anybody. Anything else is not morality at all. It's simply regulation and being an obedient slave, being too scared to challenge in any way the rules set down by Ma or Pa or by the society around us. Now, gay and lesbian people are uniquely placed to discover this law of the heart. Why? Because if we're going to have any kind of life at all, any kind of sense of ourselves as true beings loved by God with a right to exist, we have to break the laws. We have to go outside the morality, which is so narrow that no one can live in it and be healthy. You know, in, in Catholic thought, for example, that you can be homosexual, but you can never, ever act on it. You can never actually be sexual. Um, and in some of the old teaching which came down from the Middle Ages, which is still around, you can have sex, but you ought not have too much pleasure in it. You know, there was a recent um, thing that came out from the Vatican saying that, uh, actually I think it's in the New Catechism, that married people do nothing wrong, interesting term, when they seek pleasure in sexual intercourse. It's very generous of them to say so, provided they do so um, soberly and in moderation. So I have this image of all these people around the world trying to have sober and moderate orgasms. I don't think it works. And I certainly don't think that the God of orgasms 
had that in mind when he, she gave us this ecstatic and glorious experience. But even within marriage, the church is still saying, here are the railway lines. Well, certainly as a gay man, to have any sense of myself, I have to go outside of those lines. I'm forced to. And that sets me on the journey. You know, there are surveys, I wish I had them with me, I'm sorry that I don't, that show that gay people, and particularly gay priests who have a good sense of themselves, tend to have a higher level of moral development, according to stages like Kohlberg's stages, than heterosexual people and heterosexual priests. And the reason is because we have had to walk the journey for ourselves. A couple of other little quotes I'd just like to throw in. One of the beautiful one from John of the Cross, who talks about fullness of maturity in spiritual life. And he says, here on the mountain, there are no laws. There are no um, paths, for there are no laws for the just. Not that I'm saying we have all reached that point. I am saying that the journey to that point will move us in that direction towards a life which has very simple laws around love, around justice, around freedom. And of course, Augustine, who is you know, much despised in, in uh, a lot of modern thought, who says, love and do what you will, but truly love. And that has to be our guide in our morality, to truly love. Now, in this journey, of course, and I can't say this too strongly, there are going to be mistakes. There are going to be dead ends. People are going to go in the wrong direction and maybe, yes, tragically do some harm to ourselves in our development. But we can't not make the journey for that, that reason. We can't refuse to take the risks. I think of the parable of the talents in the, in the scripture where the man gives, you know, one guy ten talents or ten dollars and someone else five and someone else one and they invest them and, and they make money. Um, but, but the person who has one goes away and hides it in the ground. And he's the one who gets into trouble because, hey, this thing was not given to you to hide in the ground. This was given to you to invest, to take risks with, to live your life from, not to keep safe and enclosed, which is the way we tend to look at um, our spiritual lives. There's a wonderful um, apocryphal story added on to that parable of the talents about a man who got ten talents and took them away, invested them, and lost everything. And when the master comes back, he still says, well done, good and faithful servant, because you took a risk. You tried it out. And that is what we have to do. Make, taking risks, but supporting one another in those risks, listening to one another and discerning together in the Spirit of God. Finding balance. Now, all of that, and a lot of what I said, depends upon an inner sense, an inner sense of love, an inner sense of truth, an inner sense of what's right, of where we're led. Now, I'd want to say to anyone who's directing gay and lesbian people, and to anyone who's supporting them, and to us ourselves, we need to be careful of that inner sense. We need to be careful, because that inner sense has been so conditioned by our society and by our church, that what we at first experience may be as kind of dirty, or distasteful, or kind of unclean, or a bit yuck, can be the very thing we need to pursue. That, in a sense, has been really, really um, polluted in many ways by the church, by our teaching, by our parents. I mean, we all know that. So I'm inclined to say, where you find the resistances, where you find that feeling, look again, that probably is not the inner sense. The inner sense is not someone that says or someone that says no, no, no. Um, the inner sense is a quiet sense of wisdom and truth and clarity. It is not distaste. That's something else. And that is precisely the point where you need to fight, where you need to go, you need to look. Um, I remember one of my first experiences were very painful when I first began to explore having sex with other men. And um, it was very hard. My condition was very, very deep. And I really wanted to do the truth, to, to do the right thing, to be in a uh, relationship with God. And I had this lovely evening one time with, with a man, and it was delightful and simple and, and present. And I came away, and I had the most incredible experience of wrenching, of clash, of, of ripping inside, because everything in me wanted to say, this was bad, this was 
yuck, this was wrong, this was distasteful, you just had casual sex, my God, with someone you didn't know. But the truth was, I liked it. The truth was, it was good, it was loving, it felt gentle and pleasurable and delightful and sweet. And that was the truth. And I knew that. And thanks be to God, I could not disown that. And that critiqued the yuck and the distaste and the moral conditioning. And that was this ripping I felt inside as these two parts of me kind of wrenched against each other. Well, I'll leave it to you to decide which part won. Um, in such experiences, of course, we need to have community. We spoke a little earlier and we'll speak again about this. But to walk this journey is very difficult. Um, in Latin America, communities are of the essence. You don't do this alone. We look at black families, we look at Jewish families, and we see that these people have a basis of support where they can be nurtured and, and grow and encouraged in their uh, journey to liberation, to a sense of self. They can also return home to be um, tended and cared for and have their wounds healed. Now, we as gay people need this desperately, the more so because we don't have natural families. As a director, as someone who supports gay and lesbian people, you can be vital to this sense of community. You may be the only lifeline of support that a gay person trying to live a Christian spiritual life has. And therefore, you really need to be very centred, have done your own work, have dealt with your own shit, and be able to be truly present to them, truly present to the spirit within you and within them. Another one of the key things that um, comes from a true sense of community and a true sense of growth in the spiritual life is a sense of justice. Now, this is very, very clear in Latin America. It's very clear with Jewish people. It's very clear with black people. Sometimes it's not so clear with gay people. I really do believe that as a gay person grows in true spiritual fullness and wisdom, they're going to become very aware and very angry about the injustice and oppression that they suffer, that all gay people suffer and have suffered. You'll notice, for example, that when I began this talk, I invoked our gay and lesbian ancestors who have paid with their lives, in very many cases, for their love. You become very sensitive to this reality, very aware of this reality, not just in other people's lives, but in our own lives. And the pain and the rage, especially with the church, can be very hard to contain, and we need to find ways of expressing it, ways of listening to one another in it. Um, I remember some good gay Catholic Christians being horrified by the Stop the Church action in New York City with St. Patrick's. And I was too at first. I remember seeing someone holding a host, a piece of communion bread, whether consecrated or not, I'm not sure. But people were horrified. As we were talking, it suddenly struck me, where is the greater sin? That someone could take this bread called this is my body and hold it lightly and use it as a protest. Or that the church could take we who are the body and violate us, abuse us, spit on us, oppress and exclude us, kill us. Where is the true violation of the body of Christ? I don't think it's in stopping Mass at St. Patrick's, and I don't think that's how Jesus would see it. When he said, this is my body, he was not primarily talking about the institution of the church. The body which must be recognized and reverenced is here and is here. It's in us. And when we are oppressed and violated, the body of Jesus is violated far more truly than when a host may be violated. So let us primarily reverence and adore, worship and bow before the reality of Jesus in our own bodies and in the bodies of our lesbian and gay brothers and sisters and of all those who are oppressed. Sure, let us reverence the institutions of the church when they earn it, when they truly are church, as Jesus might have meant it, although he never used the word. Um, let's be sensitive to them and recognize the holy, but that can only come when we truly recognize the holy within us. And let us no longer allow the body of Christ to be violated in us. Let's feel the pain and the rage of that. You'll notice that a number of times in this uh, lecture I've spoken about maturity 
the importance of maturity. When I've reflected on what maturity means for gay and lesbian people, I've often been struck by the fact that one of the main institutions of life, main, main contexts in life, which heterosexual people have, which tends to lead them towards maturity and adulthood, is the family, is caring for children. Um, I'm not saying this always works. I mean, we all come from dysfunctional families, hey. But it has a, a tendency to do, um, to, to work towards maturity simply because day by day, year in, year out, people are called to run their kids to football games, to change diapers, to help with homework, to listen to their kids when they're you know, moaning and groaning or when they're, when they're sick. Constantly to put themselves aside and attend to the call of their children. There's also, of course, the wisdom and the spontaneity of children, which can shatter adult pretensions and, and, and make us step back and, and realise who we are and who we're not. All the gifts that children bring. Now, in saying that, I'm aware that surveys have shown that the average American man, for example, spends something like 12 minutes a day with his children, you know, present with his children. So I'm not in any sense suggesting that you know, all heterosexual couples live family as selflessly and as generously and as maturely as one would hope. But I am saying that there is this very natural, spontaneous context which most heterosexual people go into, which calls forth selflessness in time, in attention, in money, in energy, in resources. And this can go on for you know, 20 years. Now, hopefully, some lessons are being learned by people in that situation. Sometimes not, but the context is there. So when I've looked at gay people and thought, how, does this, how is this for us in our spiritual lives? How do we use the extra energy, the extra time, the extra leisure, and maybe the extra money? I know a lot is being said these days about our discretionary income. Well, you know, I don't have much. I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe you do. You've bought this tape. Um, but that extra time and energy that we tend to have, whether we admit it or not, which normally people would channel into family demands, what do we do with it? What is our call in it? How can that become context for learning selflessness and maturity for us? How can, how can, can this become the school of love for us, a term the monasteries in the desert used to use? I think that we have to look at a number of ways in which we are called to use the extra life and time and energy we have if we're going to be mature. One of them is to live contemplatively to truly go deeply into spiritual practice and to live very reflectively um, around what it means to be human, what it means to be sexual, what it means to be just, what it means to be loving, what it means to be alive, to go deeply into the spiritual life in a way that many people with families and the demands of baseball games and school picnics and things can't do. Another way is service. And here particularly we see it with AIDS, where people have been drawn into using their time and energy in deep service of one another without realising it. This too can be a prime way in which we can use our lives as context for growth in maturity. In other ways, through art, through creativity and through study, channeling our energy and our time and our money into developing the creative gift which expresses who we are and then can be shared with others. Another way is through justice making, through activism, whether through advocacy, whether it be through, uh, for us or for other oppressed groups. And I might add here something that I actually forgot to include when I was talking about justice, that true justice and maturity in justice has to be opening us not just to our own oppression, but to solidarity with all the oppressed. And we'll talk about that a little in uh, another tape a little later on. So here are four ways, contemplative living, service, art and creativity, which is also study, and justice making. That are ways in which we, I believe, are not, are not just able to grow to maturity, but are called to grow to maturity. I'm sorry, gay energy and life and leisure are not well served by developing bigger and better and more stylish wardrobes. They are not served by developing a better interior design. They are not served by making sure we have the latest art collection and the latest CD collection in town. They are not served by, you know, the more and more stylish and avant-garde garde hairdo. I mean, these things are not necessarily bad, 
but they are not about growth in maturity of spiritual life. Some elements of them maybe can accompany it. God knows we all need to find ways of expressing ourselves. But when they become our focus or our whole sense of self, something has gone awry. And I have to say from a Christian perspective, from a spiritual perspective, this is not authentic maturity and it certainly is not authentic liberation. It's dancing around the golden calf. We'll talk about that in the third tape, what that means. Now, of course, one of our problems in all of this is the lack of models to learn to live a mature and, and integrated spiritual gay life. We need models, we need mentors, and there are so few of them. And many of the few we have have died from AIDS or are dying of AIDS or are so engrossed in caring for AIDS, people with AIDS, they're not available for others. There is a desperate need for mature models of Christian and generally spiritual gay life. And there is a call to us, I believe, to become those models. I would like to think that people who are directors could in some sense be something of that kind of a model. There's a challenge. In all of this about growth to maturity, it's important just to mention briefly the place of psychotherapy and the place of spiritual direction. Um, we as gay people have, have come through so much emotional and psychological pain and shit that psychotherapy, which is a good idea, I mean good psychotherapy, good counselling, is a good idea for everyone in our crazy culture. But for us, it's probably something of a necessity in many cases, in most cases, if we're going to grow to true maturity. Now, at the same time, I would like to differentiate between psychotherapy and spiritual direction or spiritual guidance or spiritual practice. They're not discontinuous um, and they're not totally separate, but nor are they totally one and the same thing. Um, I do believe that a lot of psychotherapy is a, is a prerequisite, a precursor for deep spiritual living. But I also believe that spiritual life, and particularly contemplative life, takes us where psychotherapy could never go. It takes us into a depth of centeredness, into a depth of selflessness. It shadows our containers and it rebuilds us in a way that psychotherapy cannot do. And it calls us to a death of self, which psychotherapy is not about, but all true spiritual living is about. And here I don't mean some pathological a hysterical death of self, I mean a deep, profound surrender of the self. As I say, it may well be a necessary precursor to a deep spiritual life or an accompaniment, but spiritual life and I think spiritual guidance are something that is slightly different and need their own focus and their own time. Of course, in that it's important to discern when and where and how psychotherapy is needed, spiritual direction is needed. This also brings up the issue of, when I'm talking about direction, uh, spiritual guidance, the readiness of the director, the readiness of the guide. This person must be someone who has really done their work or is profoundly doing their work. Someone who really has dealt with a lot of their inner demons and a lot of their inner containers. Um, the person who I go to for spiritual guidance uses the default zone apparently in dealing with computers, which I don't deal with, you do defaults to set up margins. And he's suggesting that in spiritual life, those defaults are gradually expanded and eventually blown away. Well, a person who's going to give direction to gay people has to have very few defaults, very few limitations, very few margins, and be prepared to let go of the ones they do have. Part of the reason for this is that I really believe a gay person coming to someone for spiritual guidance is a gift to that spiritual, that, that, to that person, to that director. And they are going to stand your categories, your ideas, your concepts, your understandings of God, of spirit, of body, going to stand them on their head, turn them upside down, turn them inside out. And if you can't handle that, then don't do the work. If you're not prepared to be shattered yourself, and I suppose especially I, I speak to heterosexual directors and heterosexual guides, if you're not prepared to have those categories shattered, don't do the work. You also be very, very careful, need to be very careful of subtly giving judgments to a gay person. Sometimes if our categories are being shattered, we want someone to tell us that the old story, the old rule was the truth. Um, like that night when I had that clash and felt, this is good. No, this can't be good. I've been told this is terrible and I've taken that in. If I had had a spiritual guide 
who in the subtlest way suggested that that was the true voice and not this voice which told me that the sexual experience was good, I may well have gone with that, that judgment, that, that restriction, that old morality. You're very sensitive and vulnerable when you're going through this process of, of allowing the containers to be shattered. And judgments are picked up very quickly. So as a director, you have to step back and let go of your judgments very purely. Don't be frightened to admit you can't do the work. You can't work with the gay and lesbian person. Okay, in all of this, you also need to be a very good waiter, someone who can wait and someone who can affirm because the journey is not quick, it's not easy. You need to be able to wait with the person on the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Just a couple of very crucial points to close this, this talk um, that in a sense go to the foundation of spiritual life and that I believe are essential in understanding the gay journey. Firstly, and I'll say this very briefly, we'll develop it in the next talk, the absolute goodness and centrality of the incarnation of Christ, the goodness and centrality of sexuality, that when God becomes human, when God becomes flesh, which is a central mystery of the Christian religion. Now, whether we understand it as, you know, literally true or whether we understand it as a profound myth that informs our lives, this is absolutely crucial to the spiritual journey. God is human, human bodily, sexually, viscerally, with guts, with energy, with pain, with drives and urges and juices, um, one of Dame Edna Everidge's terms, juices, with the fullness of what it means to be human. And all of that, every part of that, especially perhaps the parts that we find hardest to own, our sexuality, our anus, um, our guts, our shit, all of this becomes saturated, impregnated, filled with the divine, so that now there is nothing human which can separate us from the presence of God, because all that is divine has come fully into all that is human. St. Paul says, but without sin. Okay, but also entering into the drives, the needs, the compulsions, the pains, the pathologies, the neuroses that give rise to sin. All of those are not sin, and in some sense, all of those God, God enters into too. All that is fully human is now impregnated with the divine. So every human experience, every human moment, every human touch, every activity of the human can now become a vehicle of the divine, a channel for the divine, a way of entering into the divine. And most especially the sexual, where we experience the juice of life itself, the creative urge itself, the urge to communion itself, that most of all is going to be impregnated with the divine, saturated with the divine. Again, we'll go into this a little more in the second talk. Secondly, in Christian spirituality, there are two ways, and this will become clear in, in the second tape and in the third tape. The first is the cataphatic way, the affirmative way, the via positiva. And what this is, is, well, look at it this way. Think of every word you've ever heard about God, every scripture passage you've ever heard, every ritual you've ever attended or seen performed or heard of, every piece of theology, every single prayer, every statue or image you've ever seen. Now along with that, think of every creature that exists, every sunset, every plant, every animal, every star, um, every thought, every concept, every feeling, everything that our mind can in any way comprehend in any way that our mind can grasp, in any way that our mind can use, anything that is accessible directly to the senses and the mind is the cataphatic way, it's the affirmative way. All of those things lead us to God or can lead us to God. And they're all that can be thought, imagined, tasted, touched, felt, seen, heard, everything is the cataphatic or the affirmative way. The apophatic way is everything else. The apophatic way is the absolute silence, the absolute darkness, 
the absence of images, the absence of thought, of concept, of feeling, of visions, of statues, the absence of creatures, the absolute stillness and silence beyond thought, beyond word, beyond image, the absolute mystery, that which is unsayable, unspeakable, unable to be conceptualized in any form, the divine darkness, the absolute unknowing. This is the apophatic, the dark, the negative way, the via negativa. And this is in us too. This is the absolute mystery which we encounter at the depth of our being, underneath all that we can conceptualize or can contain in our minds. And whatever leads us into that darkness and that silence is the apophatic way, the way of darkness and negation. God is not that, not that, not that. God is not even God. God is silence. But even silence is not God. God is beyond even silence. Now, to work with gay and lesbian people or to follow this journey as a gay and lesbian per person, I think you need to do your homework around these two ways, the cataphatic way and the apophatic way, because I believe they are very, very powerfully present in the lives of all gay and lesbian people, very both ways, very richly present. And finally, our companion, our guide, our touchstone, our joyous lover on the journey has to be a sense of celebration, a sense of hope, a sense of joy. Someone once said that joy is the infallible sign of the presence of God. And by joy, I don't just mean, you know, levity or lightness or happiness as our culture tends to define it. Um, someone once said, you know, the most unfortunate term ever coined is the pursuit of happiness, that happiness is something we have to, in some sense, chase. Joy rather wells up from the deepest part of us. It's, it's a, a feeling of a sense of well-being, a sense of possibility, a sense of goodness, a sense of hope that somehow there is life in all of this, even if it be the tiniest flicker at the very bottom of the well, even if it just be the tiniest seed which almost looks dead. There is always the possibility of new life coming from that. And that, that is joy. Now, as gay and lesbian people, we need to really be with that joy, be open to that joy, believe in that joy, walk with that joy. Because this journey is a very difficult and demanding one, there are few guides, there are few supports, especially in contemplative living and in gay living, where the church tends to oppose our gayness and gay people often tend to oppose our contemplativeness and especially our Christianity. We have to have a deep sense of joy and believe in joy. So my wish for us as we close this first talk, is that joy may be our accompaniment and our guide, our touchstone, our lover, as we journey on. And as St. Francis said at the beginning, end of his life, as he lay dying, brothers and sisters, let us begin.